Tom, do you know what day it is today? No, I don't. What day is it, Andre? <laughs> That's pretty impressive, considering uh, we are just randomly talking and recording this conversation, apparently. It is the Nintendo 64's 25th anniversary today in North America. Although, Tom... Did you know that's kind of a lie? Why? <laughs> so, get this. The 64 was originally advertised for release on September 30th. Nintendo then decided to randomly move that day up by one day to a Sunday in order to, uh, so people wouldn't take the day off from work and school and all that. However, some stores started selling the system three days early on September 26th, forcing Nintendo to let every store start selling it uh, that day, I think, which was a Thursday, I believe. Um, so technically, this, the 29th is a complete lie. <laughs> like, it never actually came out here, uh, came out on that day, but it was already being sold at most places by this point. Uh, but this was the official, like, the official date that it was supposed to come out on. And the only one that people actually remember, seemingly. Even though, in my mind, I'm like, wasn't it the 26th? And, uh, yeah, so that's why I went back and researched it. And as it turns out, that's a kind of interesting backstory for you. So. <laughs> That'd be a nice, exciting, uh, three-day early launch. Like, oh, I got it early. Like, that would just, people these days would just be raging, though. It's like, why, why did they get the system early? Oh yeah, people will be raging and posting stuff on social media. Uh, funny you mentioned that though, Tom, because I was actually one of the people who got it Who got it early. I got it a week early, in fact. I think I've told the story before. Uh, my dad used to be an insurance agent. One of his clients worked at Nintendo, and he was able to hook me up with a system a week early with Mario 64, along with an eternal player's guide. So it wasn't like the Nintendo Power kind. This thing was like a staple together, uh, black and white, like no pictures, just a bunch of text, like basically a game fact. Uh, but written by Nintendo themselves, break down how to get every star in the game. I tried to avoid using it too much, but it'll still need to have, and I wish I kept it. I don't know why I got rid of that thing. Uh, but yeah, I had a 64 a week early, and I was such a happy kid yeah, <laughs> for that week. like a classified document, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. I, I don't think there's any record of it any, anywhere from what I've seen, so maybe they still have it in some internal systems at Nintendo, but who knows. Anyways, point is, 64 is 25 years old in North America. It's a little bit older in Japan, coming out in late July, uh, but that date doesn't matter so much to us, <laughs> given the fact we were we were raised in North America. Yep. Um, and Tom, seeing as how we're pretty much only two on staff to have been around during the period of the 64, at least you know when it, as it was releasing, uh, to be cognizant of that fact at least, I thought it'd be fun for us to get together, discuss some of our memories, where we were at the point it released, and uh, just everything about it, especially given the fact we have 64 coming up on the expansion pack for Nintendo Switch Online, which is pretty great timing. So Tom, where were you when the 64 launched, and uh, what was going on in your life? Did you have one at launch even? And yeah, just tell us about it. So I didn't have one at launch. I got to play it at my friend's house. Uh, he had Mario 64, which was just amazing at the time. I remember first seeing the scene with the um, carrying the little baby penguin around and just... And dropping know, kind off of, the cliff. <laughs> yeah, being mind, being mind-blowing at the time. Um, with, I had the system a bit later because my dad... He, when the Super Nintendo came out, he's like, if you want it, you can buy it. And that was like a ton of money. And he had the same phrase with the N64. So it really kind of taught me a lesson about saving and <laughs> the value of money. Because that was basically like all my money at the time to buy one. Eventually later on with Mario Kart 64. But uh, super impressed with the system. Mario 64 and I think, uh, of course, later on Turok being really impressed with. Yeah, Turok was a really good-looking game. I remember being shocked seeing that in stores, but uh, just with like how smooth it looked, even with the ten-foot, you know, draw distance. Um, but yeah, you said something earlier uh, during that that the Nintendo 64 was kind of mind-blowing, or Mario 64 maybe specifically, and yeah. that can't really be understated. Like I remember yeah. the hype leading up to the system was. It felt massive, at least in my head it was massive. You know, like seeing the previews in Nintendo Power, playing the Ultra 64 arcade games like Killer Instinct in Cruisin' USA. And that's actually, I mentioned it in our uh, interview with Eugene Jarvis, the creator of Cruisin' USA and the entire Cruisin' series, I was uh, I was re retelling the story of how that's what convinced my dad to get us a Nintendo 64. We were on a tour at Nintendo of America with the same client who got me the Nintendo 64 uh, in the year before its release. And uh, they had a Cruisin' USA machine right outside Cafe Mar and uh, it had the advertisement for the Ultra 64, which is what the system was called before Nintendo renamed it due to copyright reasons to Ultra or to Nintendo 64. And my dad didn't care at all about games then. He 
does now, funnily enough. He didn't then. Uh, but he saw Cruise in the USA, and it sold him on it. He's like, that game looks amazing. We have to get the Nintendo 64 now. Or the Ultra 64, before it was renamed. I forget it was, if it had been named at that point. Uh, if it had been renamed at that point or not. But anyways, point is, that sold my dad on it. And uh, seeing... And I remember just like the, the, the hype and Nintendo power showing out like some, some of the early renders that the hardware would be capable of, which were all a lie. The system wasn't that strong. Uh, but then seeing the early previews for, for Mario 64, I remember my dad came up from Target one day telling me he saw Mario 64 running on an in-store kiosk, you know, before the system was out. And he was like, that game looks amazing. Like how it even blew his mind. I'm like, if my dad's impressed by a game, he doesn't even care, you know, for yeah. a type of thing he doesn't even care about, then I can't wait for it. And needless to say, turning on the game for the first time when I when I did get it, uh, it it I just remember like a sense of joy that I don't think I've ever had since. <laughs> like I don't think I'll ever be able to match the high that I had playing this mind blowing 3D game. Uh, you know, it, it, seeing Mario realized in this 3D space for the first time, and it's it's you know it, it it's always you know it's always funny to say like I feel bad for people who aren't going to have that feeling, but I'm sure they have their own their own feelings for things that I won't appreciate being older. And I think it was a perfect time in my life being 11, I think, uh, yeah. that it just like, it hit at, at the maximum, you know, peak it could for me. But just seeing, seeing the character I grew up with, you know, realize it's an entire new way, Competently, Mario 64 wasn't the first 3D game. It was one of the first to do it really freaking well though. And uh, I just remember like just, just being blown away by it and like realizing this is the future of games. And of course, Nintendo 64 had a lot of games of that caliber, including, you know, the first 3D Zelda as well. And that's time to speak of the multiplayer side of things, with it being called dubbed the fun machine in marketing. And that was true with amazing multiplayer experiences. And I would just race home from home I would race home from school almost every day to play like Smash Brothers or Goldeneye with my friends, and it was such a fun time. Yeah, Goldeneye was a huge one with all my friends. Uh, that at the time, like PlayStation it's doing fairly well, but GoldenEye was one reason people would pick up Nintendo 64s uh, coming out, you know, in 1997. But that really uh, propped up the console for a long time. Yeah, I remember when that game came out. It was a massive hit in in like in, among our school, among my schoolmates. Like everyone was talking about GoldenEye, and uh, it was we hadn't seen like a shooter quite of that type. Obviously, there've been a lot of first-person shooters like Doom and Wolfenstein, but this one kind of like showed how you could evolve the genre, introducing these really elaborate uh, 3D levels that felt surprisingly like authentic. In that the designs don't didn't seem to make a lot of sense by game standards because they were based on like real life standards. So there were rooms that wouldn't even have a purpose just so you could go explore them. I had objectives that would change based on the difficulty. Uh, so it had a really great single player and of course the multiplayer was so addictive and so fun. It's still I think pretty unique feeling to this day. The only series I really got close was of course Time Splitters, which was you know made largely by the original team, which makes sense. Um, but yeah, the Nintendo 64. It, 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 it was, I remember it was weird for me, like, realizing, you know, that it, it, apparently it didn't sell nearly as well as PlayStation at that time, or, you know, ever. You know, PlayStation, yeah. I would see the sales charts, I'm like, man, how is PlayStation beating it? Because, like, for, among my friend group, we only had 64s, like, we would only play 64. And that, you know, and so realizing that there was more outside my media bubble, you know, where people are playing this other platform, and I just, like, couldn't fully understand it. And it wouldn't be until really years later that I would actually really be able to start, you know, checking out PlayStation games, because almost none of my friends had one. Uh, so that was just kind of a weird realization, that Nintendo wasn't king anymore, even though it felt like they should be, because they were making these amazing games, even if there were, like, big delays between them. But then PlayStation was also, of course, having its own slate of amazing games, just, you know, of a kind of different sort, maybe a more mature sort, whereas Nintendo was still targeting the family, you know, the family-friendly, and some might say even, like, younger demographic at that time, so... Yeah, and also cartridges were a big part of that, which were amazing for no-load times. Uh, but the price of cartridges was way more than CDs, of course, which is why so many third-party party developers developed on PlayStation. So. Yep, that's a great point. It's is definitely a key reason why. It was just far cheaper to make a game with far more space. The only real drawback was the loading time, which, to be fair, it was a pretty big drawback. I do remember playing, like, Twisted Metal uh, at, 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 like, Target again, and uh, just being 
really annoyed by like the 30 second load times between rematches and multiplayer like it was super fun but like it took forever to get back into a match and you know coming off mario kart 64 did the kong racing where you had that instant replayability um it was a bit of a harsh transition but uh it was delivering experiences we hadn't seen up you know we hadn't seen really at all up to that point so i can totally see why it caught on also the fact that i had launched a year earlier helped it too so yeah nintendo had a lot of things uh going against it at that point i think um but yeah yeah and um one of the two is uh of course piracy <laughs> People like PlayStation because they could uh, easily pirate it. <laughs> just, yeah, just <laughs> copy games. <laughs> Good times. Um, with uh, Nintendo 64, though, it really had a couple of great years there, and you could, it definitely leveled up a lot as the system went on. Like They learned so much about creating 3D games and developers during that time and kind of coding them better, I believe, for assembly, <laughs> which is extremely hard. <laughs> so uh, when... Ocarina of Time came out, that was another huge jump over all the games that came out before it, I would say, too. So that was, like, almost as big as a Mario 64 moment in my mind, like, how detailed that world was. Oh, I mean... How amazing it was. 100%. I mean, I remember the hype leading up to Ocarina of Time just being through the roof. Like, they had the gold cartridge, they had the theatrical ad campaigns with the, uh, you know, with the 60-second teaser in, yeah, in theaters before movies. Um... And I remember, like, going to Toys R Us to pick up my copy of the game. I said this before, like, being surprised by, you know, why aren't there more people here picking up the game? But, you know, looking back, it's like, you know, it, I realized it's because I showed up after school at 3 p.m. And maybe everyone had already picked it up, or, you know, maybe it wasn't as big of an event as I thought. In any case, the hype was huge leading up to that game. And I remember I was so... I, I loved playing it so much that even when I went to my grandparents for Thanksgiving that year, which was just a couple... few days even after Ocarina of Time's release, uh... Yeah, November 21st, I think, was its release. Somewhere around there, 23rd, maybe. Yeah, 21st. Um, 21st, yeah. Um, I, I, would, I took my entire 64 over to my grandparents' house. I would just play in the basement. I'd be totally antisocial <laughs> and just <laughs> play Ocarina of Time. Um, and yeah, seeing like that huge world, like it was a Breath of the Wild moment back in the day. Like, you know, you go back and the world just feels quaint now, but then it felt massive. And they had the real-time lighting effects with the, you know, real-time day and night, or, you know, the day and night cycle and how the shadows would change or at least blink shadow would change. And by that, I mean even barely a shadow. <laughs> like, his, his, a portion of his legs have a shadow. But it was all, like, you know, very impressive stuff back then. And, uh, yeah, it, I can't really understate, like, just how... Like, how many moments we had like that on 64. Whether it was, like, genre-pushing, you know, games like Mario 64, GoldenEye, even Banjo-Kazooie, take what Mario did and even elaborating upon it. Um, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day really pushing limits, even at the tail end of the things. And then just how fun multiplayer was. There was so much... So many games on there. I've already covered some of them, but like even lesser known titles like uh, the new Tetris, you know, Dr. Mario 64 with its four player action, uh, Snowboard Kids, Beetle Adventure Racing, which is a great first player, uh, single player game as well. So many great racing games, a lot, just a ton of great games in general. Uh, uh, Forsaken was super fun um, and is a type of game I haven't really even seen since, you know? I could go on and on of just how exciting that library was, even if. It, it did, you know, there were gaps in there. There were, we'd sometimes go months before getting another game, even, especially early into its release. There were only two games that launched, three in Japan if you count the chess game, uh, being Mario 64 and Palo Wing 64. But both of those games are so freaking good, it didn't really matter. And then we had waivers coming out shortly after, It's you know, in the Mario Kart 64 early the following year. Um, it just, it, I don't know, I felt like there was enough there to keep me entertained, for the most part. Some of the gaps toward the end did get a little lengthy, like, by the time of Conquer, we had like a half year nothing. long gap. Yeah, yeah. nothing exactly. <laughs> uh, releases were a lot more special back then on Nintendo 64. Like, you really had a lot longer to master the game, especially with multiplayer, and play them with your friends and um, have something to look forward to in the future. So it was more like big events than now. Now it's just like, well, this game's not good. I have like a million other games to play. Um, it, it's not the same as it was back then. So even though it was bad. <laughs> that there was very limited releases. Uh, it was very neat in its own way. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but I, yeah, I just have so many memories from, from that era. And they also give birth to, you know, the, the as I already kind of touched on, like the first 3D installments of a lot of series, not Metroid. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Joey. Um, but also like the introduction of some entire new series as well. Uh, like with Super Smash Bros. 64. And also, uh, actually, I was going to say almost the end of some series. We did get one more F-Zero after 
uh, after F, after X at least. Mario um, Party but, too. Oh yeah, Mario exactly Mario Party. Yeah, which we're now getting, which is fitting again. We're now getting a game that pays that pays homage to the first three, which were on Nintendo sixty four, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, I had so much fun with Mario Party back in the day. I remember like seeing the seeing the previews for it. I'm like, wow, a board game that you play on your system? What? But I've got to check this out and. It was infuriating, like that game was <laughs> one of the most infuriating multiplayer experiences you could have, also one of the most rewarding. It was just so fun to uh, to play this chaotic game where winning almost didn't matter because <laughs> it could change in the you know the drop of a hat, so Yeah, and I think also with the Nintendo 64, something about it is that you know Ultimate Party system and it had a lot of games quickly like now we might have to wait five plus years for a sequel back then it was sort of two to three year windows and that's pretty impressive being a 3d platform i guess teams you know of course smaller back then but uh looking back compared to now they did a pretty good job it kind of depends yeah i mean to some extent we we of course never got second mario on the system but we did yeah. get you know majora's mask not too long after ocarina of time uh and that game had a you know, remarkably short development cycle um, you know, and, and then we even got you know, multiple uh, installments of some other series like Banjo Kazooie and Banjo Tooie. Um, trying to think of other consider examples. Goldeneye Perfect Dark. Like oh, Goldeneye Perfect Dark. Good. They're essentially yeah, exactly, very similar games. Um, so yeah, that is so that is something we would obviously see less of as time went on, just as game development cycles grew and grew. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it was definitely an era of like experimentation. You know, Nintendo is still figuring things out themselves. You know, like, you going, going back to Mario 64, it definitely has some rough patches these days. But it's still easy to admire, like, for how it was a trailblazer for what would come ahead. Like, Nintendo had to figure out all this stuff for the first time, pretty much. Like, how are we going to make a 3D game work that plays well, that isn't forgettable and terrible, you know? And the fact that it still largely holds up to this day, having recently been re-released as part of Mario 3D All-Stars, that's like a huge cre a huge testament to um, to its staying power and like the strength of its gameplay, that it's still fun to play even 25 years later. Um, and then, yeah, and then uh, I also want to touch on Majora's Mask, which I think is still might be one of my favorite 3D Zeldas, and just try something entirely new with it, you know, whereas it's easy to look back now and consider Ocarina of Time a little more than like a 3D update of, say, A Link to the Past, even though that is really underselling like what that game had to do to achieve what it did. But Majora's Mask definitely turned everything on its head, had a wild like Groundhog's Day like concept, and just you know investing into the characters and the world. The world itself was essentially a character, and I loved everything about it. And uh, you know we haven't really seen a Zelda quite like that since. Um, we'll see, you know, with Breath of the Wild 2, if, if it's anything similar, but, um, yeah, 64 was just a really fun experimental era with Nintendo trying to figure out how to make these franchises work in 3D, trying some new things, um, including accessories, like with the Rumble Pack, the 64 effectively yep. invented Rumble, um, which is still around, of course, so. Yeah, was it, uh, they had a Rumble Pack and then a DualShock controller came out after, I believe? Well, so, um, uh, yeah, oh, right, on PlayStation, yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah, yes. around that era, but it's like a neat sort of thing to plug into the back controller. Like it wasn't built in. <laughs> we actually we haven't even touched on the fact it, it invented the analog control stick too. Oh my yeah. god, my green button isn't working. <laughs> it's, oh no, it's just gone. <laughs> It's got a hole in it. What? How'd that happen? Um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it. I know a lot of people make fun of the controller because you need three hands. It's like, wow, have you never driven a manual car before either? <laughs> um, but the analog stick was massive, and Mario 64 was a perfect showcase for it. For it. Uh, also of lesser value, or is more uh, something that's not appreciated much, are the C buttons, which I think are still genius. Um, just having the simplicity with understanding where they are. Uh, you know, C up, C down, C left, C right. I wish they stuck with that paradigm. And uh, it, the only thing, I mean, the, really one of the main things that was missing uh, was just a second analog stick, which the DualShock, I believe, also added, right? It had, yeah. Yeah, added the two control sticks. Um, so Sony just had to wound up Nintendo in that sense. Uh, and then, of course, the Z button too, the trigger, and then the expansion slot. The 64 was really, like, they were doing a lot of brand new things then. And and the fact that they, they kind of, like, delivered as well as they did, I think is impressive for their first, like... Again, a lot of people make fun of the controller, but it ha like no matter how you played, it was it was pretty comfortable, you know. Unless you're you have freakishly large hand large hands like uh, my good friend Skylar, who holds it from the outside <laughs> and he uses the control stick in the middle like that. <laughs> and it was uh, 
it's kind of interesting looking at the controller back now. Like it kind of showed that Nintendo thought there still might be a lot of 2D game focus around developing that left side of the controller. Like it's going to a new era. You're not sure what you're going to rely on or not. So that's a good stuff. point. I mean, that maybe is the biggest mark against the 64 is that they barely use the side of the controller. Like, not even the 2D game Nintendo made, being Yoshi's Story, didn't use that side of the controller. So some games would just use it for, like, optional things, I think. Um, Tetris used it, I think, for the for the actual gameplay. Um, but it largely was underused, and that perhaps is the biggest mark against it, is just that they didn't take full advantage of the controller that they made. Um, but hey, they're, they are releasing it as part of the expansion pack for... Uh, for Nintendo Switch Online, which I'm happy for, because uh, when they ported the games to other to other platforms like Virtual Console, you have to use a right stick to use the C buttons. It's just not the same. It's not yeah. as responsive, especially when you need to hit multiple C buttons at a time. It just doesn't work as well with a control stick. Yeah, they're a lot snappier, especially in games like Mario 64 when you're moving the camera around. So. Right, true. Um, trying to think of any, of any other like high points in 64 we want to mention like we could be here all day talking about everything but we don't want to be here for that long um but i think also speaking of, speaking of controllers it was also the first system i believe with four controller ports built in of yeah. course controllers i believe went for 30 bucks at the time each which seems cheap these days that was expensive then so you had to pay basically um another hundred dollars just to just to play multiplayer with all your friends which I think most people did because it was worth it and it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time to do that, like chip away at buying extra controllers because sometimes you would have a friend that could come over with a controller, but uh, at the time it was like a daunting task. Like, yeah, I buy the system and stuff. Now it's like, well, eventually I have to get four controllers too. Like, it was a lot. Like, controllers now are a lot, but back then, yeah. For me in Canada, it was 40 bucks to get one. So, so do you remember playing multiplayer much uh, back oh. then? What, was, what were your favorite games you would play? Starting off with Mario Kart 64. Yep. And, that was in uh, mode especially. Yeah, moving on to uh, Diddy Kong Racing. And we did have NHL 94 being in Canada. <laughs> and uh, after that, you know, F Zero X. And um, of course, GoldenEye and Perfect Dark. Those were the main ones with my friends. Yeah, that's that's a great selection, and that definitely was among my friend group as well. But we played a bunch of like stuff: Tetris Sphere, uh, New Tetris, as I mentioned, Cruising World, <laughs> um, great Cruising USA, all the cruising games basically. Um, I already touched on Snowboard Kids, Beetle Venture Racing, um, uh, the the wrestling games, WCW versus NWO. I just rebought that one. I'm eager to play it. I, I I haven't revisited it yet, but that game was so fun. Being able to reach in the audience and grab a chair and just be your friends with it. Um, uh, Pokemon Puzzle League, uh, which was amazing, being, you know, uh, Tetris Attack, effectively, or uh, Poyo Poyo, no, not Poyo Poyo, um, what's it called? Pound Upon. Um, yeah, you know, what what else was it? God, there were so many games, like, there were just so many fun games, and uh, I remember this was during the era that Nintendo would occasionally send out, like, VHS tapes uh, to Nintendo Power subscribers to, like, hype up the games coming up. And I remember just seeing, like, all those games. Like, I want to play all of them. They all look so fun. Even if they ran at a frame rate of, like, 15 to 20 <laughs> frames per second. Uh, Jeff Force Gemini! Um, all the all the rare games. Donkey Kong 64, even for as bad as that game could be at times. The multiplayer was still fun, so... Yeah, Jet Force Gemini was an interesting one. It's sort of the first time we got to look at, for me developers having to change their game kind of radically as it went along. There was that in Conquer in that era where Jet Force Gemini was going to have younger right. main characters and they delayed it like three or six months to update the cast and kind of be a bit more mature even. Yeah, a little bit more teenage, like like late teens until, you know, besides yeah. like early kids, which makes sense considering that game was relatively violent. <laughs> um, I think being T-rated like with like aliens blowing up like gushing green blood constantly you could you could shoot the the characters you're trying to save being the tribals and decapitate them you can even collect their heads for whatever reason which is kind of messed up actually so yeah, one does get crushed in like its very first cutscene by uh, yep. alien <laughs> that's right that also reminds me perfect dark originally was going to support the game boy camera via the transfer pack which you could connect to your to the controller uh slot and you're going to be able to take pictures of your friends and put them in perfect dark and shoot them in multiplayer. Wisely, Nintendo cut that feature. But you can still see some remnants of it, like uh, Mr. Miyamoto being in the game, or Ken Lobb, which were, I believe, all taken using the Game Boy camera. So or IGN staff. Or IGN staff. Matt Cassman is in there. <laughs> That's right. I forget uh, 
who else? Maybe Doug Perry? I don't think Fran's in there, but I yeah. could be misremembering. Um, yeah, so that that was another another thing. Um, but yeah, do you have any other memories, Tom, you want to give a shout-out to? Uh, or games? Well, just... Uh, I would say is a neat era for collectathon platformers until Donkey Kong 64 kind of put that nail in the coffin to kind of end it for a while and slow it down and just being super impressed by Conquer at the very end like the huge uh, leap compared to Mario 64 in terms of graphics voice acting uh, overall presentation was very impressive this was yeah this was during the I mean this is something that you can really appreciate you know, being, you know, having been born since, I imagine. I don't know, maybe I'm off base on this, but I feel like you, no one is going to understand how good looking games like Conquer or Banjo Kazooie or Ocarina of Time looked back in the day, you know? Like, back then, like, every game was, you know, every major game at least was like a significant step forward and like showed things we hadn't seen before. And, you know, you look back at, you know, some of those games now and they're very obviously, very clearly dated. They may still look, you know, visually pleasing to some degree but they're not they're obviously not gonna blow minds and that kind of sucks you know i think it is i mean just that no one is gonna appreciate that again you know no one's gonna be able to understand like what it was like seeing these games for the first time like seeing conquer with like proper lip syncing or uh seeing the uh seeing the pokemon in pokemon snap being realized in these 3d environments i mean yeah there's obviously new pokemon snap these days and it looks amazing but you know I don't think it's going to deliver the same feelings as it was when we were kids, seeing that for the first time. Seeing what were only eight big characters up to that point, in black and white, largely, uh, entirely, uh, being now shown in 3D. It's like, oh my god, this is so cool. You know, seeing this giant Snorlax along the path, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a big uh, era of pioneering 3D graphics and what could be done in games, so. And kind of to that point, so yeah, Rare, actually, I want to give another shout out to Rare, and you kind of brought this up at some other during another discussion, I think. Yeah. Like, we can't undersell how valuable Rare was to Nintendo back then. Without Rare, Nintendo would have been screwed. Like, they, they obviously lost the console war already to Sony, but they were still doing okay, by and large. But if they hadn't had Rare by their side, I don't know what Nintendo would have done. Like, almost half... Like, I, I'm sure if you break it down, Nintendo had more games than Rare. But it did seem like... I mean, I'm sure... I'm positive they did. But, like, it felt like... Other major releases, like Rares was almost every other one. Like, Rare was there constantly. And uh, and they were arguably the ones pushing, you know, uh, possibly doing more or even better or taking better advantage of the system than Nintendo was at points. I think Diddy Kong Racing was a better game than Mario Kart 64. Banjo-Kazooie, the argument could possibly be made for such, even though Mario 64 was obviously amazing. Uh, but, um, you know, GoldenEye, Perfect Dark were games that Nintendo was even exploring at that time. Um, and each game looked, you know, incredible, and they were really pushing the hardware. And another company that was really pushing the hardware, too, was Factor 5, with uh, their, you know, uh, with their Star Wars games, like uh, Rogue Squadron, and then um, Battle for Naboo, uh, and even Indiana Jones, which, impressively, somehow, it was a port, I believe, from the PC version, or maybe PC came later, I can't quite remember. The point is, the 64 version was apparently the better version, in some respects, because uh, they were one of the only companies to go in and actually reprogram the microcode of the 64, meaning they could take better advantage of the hardware, and they use that to its, a, to its full advantage, being able to do things that no, really no other developer was really doing at that point. That's I think, I think maybe rare, too. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you got incredible results uh, as a result. <laughs> yeah, so. it was a fantastic era. I only wish I tried even more games as a kid, like there wasn't really internet back then, or there was like IGN 64. IGN 64, yep. And like you could only get screenshots and stuff of games uh, with very little video previews. So. Those these tiny, those tiny little videos that yeah took forever to download. Unless you yeah. were at school where you had a decent internet internet connection. Uh, yeah, those postage stamps themed videos. I, I still remember I would log on, like I would go to the library, the school library after school every day, log on to IGN 64, catch up on all the news, download the little postage stamp videos, and I remember. Specifically, watching the uh, the Zelda like a Zelda trailer where you see the goddesses fly in from the sky. I'm like, this looks incredible! My God, even at this one twelve, you know, one twelve by sixty resolution or whatever it was. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was like it was exciting then. I don't know, just like every every piece of news, you know, was was super fun. And that's where I, and that's where my love of IGN started actually. Before I you know was hired by them several years later. You know, 
like you know, like ten years later or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I remember their their mascot. They actually used to be they used to have the domain n64.com, uh, which include they even had a picture of like Mario reading a newspaper to represent the news, which they had to change all of that because Nintendo wanted to buy the domain <laughs> and force them to uh, to get IGN64. But apparently that that whole thing actually went down pretty smoothly, from what I understand. Apparently Nintendo was handled it quite well. So yeah. But if any, I, <laughs> any final thoughts? I guess. Uh, yeah. I would say. Probably looking back, being in high school at the time and having, you know, like three friends come over to play it, it's probably my most favorite generation because I love playing games with friends. That one uh, had the most opportunities to do that and uh, made the most hours logged on the system. And I do regret me later not picking up a 64 DD. That would have been cool to see. Yeah, right. I mean, not that you had many opportunities to. No. Being, seeing as it only released in Japan and had only 10 games, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope they do something with that for the NSO expansion pack. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I would agree with that sentiment. I think 64 might be my favorite generation. Just, I think it hit at a perfect time in our lives where, you know, we had a fair amount of free time. We had a lot of friends around. Um, and we were getting these amazing experiences constantly focused on the local multiplayer experience. And I know it's just, it was a marketing slogan being the fun machine, uh, but it was true. It was a super fun machine, even. <laughs> um, and I just had a constant blast with it. And speaking of blasts, Bomberman 64 is another game I wanted to call out. N another amazing, perhaps still my favorite Bomberman game I've played. Uh, but yeah, just a lot of great experiences, a lot of great memories, a lot of, uh, especially with games that were doing things for the first time ever. And that's something that, you know, you're, I don't think we'll, we'll see again on that scale. Like where we were just seeing games constantly reinvent themselves and experiment at that time. Whereas now games have fallen in, you know, we, we, they've ironed out the kinks. They, there's a template, I mean, maybe not a template, but there's a lot of standards now in the industry. It's a lot less experimental as a result, uh, not to say there's none. Obviously, the indie scene's doing some very interesting things. But in the AAA space, you know, you kind of know what you're getting into with the game these days. Um, even the latest, you know, Call of Duty or Battlefield or, you know, any really shooter, they all kind of like, you know, there's a similarity to all of them. And it doesn't have the same excitement it did then. Again, especially at, I think, the ages we were, um, yeah. where it just, everything just hit a little bit harder. Um, so, yeah. 64, great memories. Happy birthday to it 25 years later. And I can't wait for all of you to either re-experience it or experience it for the first time when it, when some of these games hit Nintendo Switch Online as part of the expansion pack. With a far better frame rate, I bet. <laughs> hopefully, at least a better resolution and hopefully a better frame rate too. I did so, I did play 1080, Banjo-Kazooie, and Diddy Kong Racing today. All the frame rates on those were pretty good at least. So. How was it going back to Banjo-Kazooie real quick? I remember, I mean, every time I revisit that game, it's always a pleasure. And I think it's still perhaps one of the best looking games on the system, but... Does that still hold up, or...? Uh, it's still really good looking, really smooth in most areas. Um, I kind of wish the controls were a little bit snappier at times. Like, it is like a slow bear moving around, so I always run with Kazooie. Um, but I think... Whoa, 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 whoa. Or if, I can't make the noise. It's super yeah. annoying running noise. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, of course, getting the grunty uh, rhyming quotes during the... Her giant lair was always... Uh, it's still funny today. I love... No, she was great. And that's that's actually one of the reasons why I didn't like Banjo-Tooie Banjo as much the first time. Because they ruined Grunty. She stopped rhyming. I'm like, how could you do... How could you stop the one... Like, the, one of my favorite things from the original game. And, uh... I, one more point about uh, Banjo, and I think Rare in general, is they had an edge to them that Nintendo's games didn't. Like, whereas Sony was actively targeting an older demographic, a more mature demographic, it felt like Rare was there to kind of help Nintendo do the same a little bit. You know, yeah. where, Ban where Banjo, like, did have an edge to it. Like, Grunty, like, makes a strip tease joke at some point. It's like, wow, <laughs> How that's amazing. That's funny to read in the E-rated Nintendo game. Uh, Goldeneye and Perfect Dark, of course, are more, more mature titles. Even Jeff Force Gemini is already touched on. Um, so it's, yeah, so I think... Again, I think without Rare, Nintendo would have been really up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> and it would have been bad news for them, so... Yeah, most valuable second-party developer ever. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
I think, uh, I think he said it. All right, everyone, that is our 25-year 25, 25 retrospective of the Nintendo 64. Like I said, we could literally be here for hours talking about it, but, you know, we've got, we got stuff to do. I'm sure you have stuff to do, so we're going to end it here. But thank you so much for watching. Uh, let us know what your favorite memories are of the 64, or what you're excited to revisit or visit for the first time. Uh, thanks to the expansion pack in the comments below. We'd love to hear what you think of it. And, of course, stay tuned to Game Explained for uh, more on the expansion pack at 64 and everything else Nintendo as well. With that, we'll catch you later. Bye, everyone.